so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hello, Gemma here, and welcome to our final episode for the summer, revisiting some of the more criminally aligned investigations explored by our sister podcast, Extraordinary Stories. In part three of The Disappearance of Peng Shui, the team look at China's Me Too movement and explore what the story of Peng Shui tells us about feminism in China. We'll see you on Thursday for brand new True Crime Conversations. It's February in Beijing. The Winter Olympics opening ceremony is just hours away. Years of planning will culminate in a spectacle of light, music, dance and Chinese culture to mark the start of a fortnight of competition as the world's best take to the snow and ice. This first performance is dedicated to the celebration of spring, to renewal, to growth. Today is Li Chun the beginning of spring and as we start to leave the freezing temperatures behind us our hosts want to welcome everyone to a new spring together. Attention however is being pulled elsewhere. All eyes are on a 36 year old tennis player, a former world number one in doubles and a three-time Olympian herself. Her name is Peng Shui. In two days, Peng Shui is set to give her first interview to a non-Chinese media outlet since November 2021, since she accused one of the most powerful men in China of forcing her to have sex with him. We haven't seen her since, except for in footage filmed and distributed by China's state-run media. I'm not sure she's free. And nobody can say she's free now. The last time we heard from her, Peng Shui risked everything. Now, she would be front and centre at the world's most watched and most revered sports tournament. But was she there of her own free will? And would she really be able to tell anyone what had truly happened to her? The Chinese spin doctors and the way that they try and turn this story into it, oh no, everything's great, Peng Shui's happy, look here she is at the Winter Olympics, yay, everything's fine, look at how much fun she's having. And everyone sits there and sees right through it these days and says, you are lying. Welcome to the final instalment of The Disappearance of Peng Shui. Over the last two episodes, we've explored the life of a Chinese tennis player who disappeared in the wake of her allegations of sexual assault at the hands of a high-ranking Chinese official. We've heard how she vanished and then made an unusual return. What followed were a series of staged photo ops flanked by officials from the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP and a complete denial of the detailed post she wrote only weeks before. Her allegation has attracted global attention as it involved China's powerful official. This is why that part was pretty powerful and uh, attracted uh, the attention of netizens and people globally and um, for the media. So at the same time, it triggered concerns on her safety and the way in which China was going to handle her allegation. In this episode, we'll hear how the Chinese propaganda juggernaut shifted its attention to the global sporting stage, propped up by a committee that describes itself as at the very heart of world sport, supporting athletes everywhere. But what happens when the international community's peak sporting body is accused of silencing a sexual assault survivor? The IOC is complicit in all of this. They're basically spouting China's propaganda. And what of China's Me Too movement? What does the story of Peng Shui tell us about feminism in China? What's next for her and the masses of women just like her? I'm Emma Gillespie, and this is Extraordinary Stories. After a series of state media released videos showing Peng Shui was, for all intents and purposes, okay, Western media had still not been placated. We still hadn't heard from Peng in her own words, and pressure was mounting on organisations to take a stand. So far, only the Women's Tennis Association had been brave enough to, when they suspended all tournaments from mainland China. Over the years, I've seen 
international sports organizations, multinational business corporations, they chose to keep quiet about human rights abuses in China in order to be able to access the Chinese market, which is huge. So that had been the norm. So seeing a international sports organization just say, we think human rights is bigger than business. We are willing to pay a price for the sake of human rights, for the sake of protecting you know, our athletes was really striking you know, to see such a change from organization to take such a stand is, you know, it's very inspiring. That's senior researcher from Human Rights Watch, Yachu Wang. By the end of 2021, the WTA had made their position clear as attention shifted to the International Olympic Committee. The Winter Olympics were to be held in Beijing and commentators had begun to wonder how and if Peng Shui would be used in the Games and whether or not the IOC were going to have anything to say to the Chinese government about their silencing of the tennis star. After mounting pressure in the days and weeks after Peng Shui vanished, the IOC issued a statement. It said, We've seen the latest reports and are encouraged by assurances that she is safe. But none of those sightings or assurances that they were talking about had been verified by any independent bodies or media. Two days later, on November 21, the IOC finally held a video call with Peng Shui, and Olympic Committee President Thomas Buck subsequently announced she was safe and well. The call lasted 30 minutes and was attended by the IOC President Thomas Buck, its China representative and its Athletes Commission Chair. Here's what they said. We, uh, as a sports organisation, are doing everything to ensure that she is happy. We've invited her to come to Europe and we will meet her again. I don't think it's a judgment for the IOC to make. It was a stark contrast to the attitude from the Women's Tennis Association. And we won't be comfortable until we have a chance to speak with her directly and make sure that she knows that we're worried about her. Criticism of the International Olympic Committee response to meeting with Peng Shui stretched far and wide as it became clear they wouldn't be taking any action or holding China to account ahead of the Games in February. Yachu Wang says the IOC went in the opposite direction of the WTA. They chose to be complicit in the Chinese government's censorship and propaganda. I was surprised that they were willing to go that route because Human Rights Watch has engaged with IOC over the years for various issues, not just, you know, with regard to the 2022 Beijing Olympics, with other Olympics that held before, we knew that the IOC was always quiet about human rights issues. They want, you know, their games to be carried out. They want to make money from having those games. As Yachu points out, with the games held in Sochi in Russia just a few years earlier, this wasn't the first time the IOC had engaged with a country with, well, a questionable track record when it comes to human rights. At the least, you know, the IOC during the Sochi game in Russia, they said something about the crackdown on LGBT rights in the country. So they made some effort when they face pressure from activists. But uh, they didn't say anything with regard to the Beijing Olympic Games. Horrible abuses are happening in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, in the rest of China. But they didn't say anything. You know, they actively participated in this propaganda machine. Is what the IOC did shocking? Yes. Is what they did surprising? Absolutely not. That's journalist Tom Steinford from Channel 9's 60 Minutes. Tom and his team brought Peng Shui's plight to the attention of many Aussies When it comes to the inaction from the IOC, Tom thinks it's a case of profit over people. This is an organisation that for so long has chased money and sold its any sort of moral compass off to the highest bidder. I mean, whatever they want to do for sponsorship dollars, for money, for hosting rights, they have been willing, particularly with the Chinese government, been willing to be complicit with regimes that are just are pretty awful, to be honest. I mean, their dealings with the Russian government, I mean, they tried to help normalise Russia for a, a long time there around the Sochi Winter Games. 
how's that worked out for the world in the long term? What do we think of the Russian regime now? But go back four years ago, the IOC was telling the world how beautiful and cuddly Russia was. Well, I think we've seen the cards laid bare now. And it's a similar thing with China. These nations try and buy off support. It's called sports washing. They do it in all sorts of forms, whether that be Middle Eastern authoritarian governments buying up soccer teams in the Premier League or paying off FIFA to host World Cups. And the IOC has been as bad as anyone at this in terms of taking dirty money to try and legitimise regimes and paint them out to be these beautiful forward nations that love humanity, when in reality, behind the scenes, they are carrying out atrocities. From the opening ceremony to the women's free ski big air final, Peng Shui sightings became a regular occurrence. A Chinese official and IOC President Thomas Bach were never far from her side throughout. And to the disappointment of, well, mostly everyone, once the time finally came for Peng Shui to speak to a non-Chinese independent media organisation, it was a similar scene. On the 6th of February 2022, a French sports magazine called L'Equipe published their interview with Peng Shui. It was headlined, My life has been what it's supposed to be. Nothing special. And said, For the first time since her public reappearance and the turmoil caused by her 2nd of November message, Chinese tennis player Peng Shui talks to an international and independent medium. The interview was conducted between Peng Shui and two journalists from Le Kip at a hotel in Beijing. Peng wore the jacket of the Chinese ice hockey team in a nod to their Olympic effort. During her hour-long interview with the sports publication, Peng Shui did her best to backtrack on her original statements. And here's the kicker. She completely denied any sexual abuse. Sexual assault. I never said anyone had sexually assaulted me in any way. So what about her Weibo post? Here's the editor of Le Kip speaking to Channel 9's 60 Minutes. When uh, I asked her, um, how is uh, her post to on Weibo were uh, deleted? And uh, she said to me, um, uh, I deleted it. Okay, and I asked her, why do you decide it? Because I decided it, she said. Peng Shui told Le Kip, She just wants this whole thing to fade into the background. There was a huge misunderstanding in the outside world following this post. I don't want the meaning of this post to be twisted anymore, and I don't want any further media hype around it. Tom Steinfurt says it felt like the world was left with more questions than answers. You feel like every time you see a photo or a video of her just out of frame, there's someone standing off to the side, you know, half... I say it half jokingly, pointing a gun at her, saying, remember what we told you to say. There's something very uncomfortable, mysterious, unnatural about the way that this is playing out, almost like a car crash. You can't look away because it's horrible. Dr. Pan Wang teaches media, communication and gender in China at the University of New South Wales. She says when it comes to propaganda for an international audience, China wants to make sure it's in control of telling its own story and telling it well. This is tied to Xi Jinping's vision of Chinese media. And and also propaganda serves the purpose to report the news from China's perspective. This is very defensive and reactive in nature, especially towards distorted reports on China from China's perspective. And also another purpose for the propaganda targeting the outside world is to reshape the global information environment that China considers important. No one seemed to believe Peng Shui was speaking freely in that interview with the French newspaper. So does it even matter to the CCP what we think of their efforts to censor this story? It does matter to them. and That's why we're saying the government is using Twitter and is using other platforms to deliver messages to the international community. For example, the video that we saw, that's also to reassure the international audience that Peng Shui was safe and there was nothing to worry about. Yachu Wang says while she can't speak specifically to Peng Shui's case, there's certainly been a history of staged media ops just like this one. You know, it's usually in a lot of you know, videos, they were given a script, let's say a human rights lawyer. 
she had fought for you know justice for people who were abused and then she got detained then she would appear on tv you would see a journalist interview her you know she would say i did something wrong i confessed to my crime i should have not done that then in fact she was given the script and she had to say what to, she was supposed to say she had to memorize those lines. So you, you know, on TV, you would say her and the journalist. But outside of that, there were security personnel that are watching the whole scene. So that is the kind of staged interview, staged conversation that it would take in place. I think people also have basically a bullshit meter. And this has set people's radars absolutely off. Tom says the international community is too smart to buy into the cover-up. If they were serious, they would let Peng Shui fly to London, to Switzerland, to America, whatever it may be, and with no Chinese officials present, let her sit in a room with some foreign authorities, with foreign journalists, whatever it may be, and let her answer questions freely without coercion, intimidation. I mean, I saw one interview she did with Le Kip, a French newspaper, and standing right next to her the whole time was a Chinese government official. Of course, she's not going to then spill the beans on how the vice premier of China sexually abused her. Of course, that's not going to happen. So if China was serious, of course, they'd be doing things differently. But we are all almost gripped by the never-ending stream of lies that they're willing to roll out. In what many would consider to be a pretty intimidating situation, journalist Tom Steinford had front row seats to confronting these lies. When during his research for Channel 9's 60 Minutes, he was able to interview one of the CCP's favoured mouthpieces, a man named Victor Gao. Victor Gao is an interesting character. I've had dealings with him before for other stories we've done on China. And while he's not an official Chinese government spokesman as such, no one in China speaks publicly about government affairs without the government effectively signing off on it, knowing that this is a man that will be representing China on the world stage. And, you know, the fact that I've interviewed him before, put it this way, if the Chinese government didn't like and approve of what he was saying, there's no way they'd allow him to stump up for another interview with us again. Tom thinks the fact that Victor is a regular on 60 Minutes tells us that he's spouting talking points approved by the CCP and that he's a man with connections that go all the way to the top of the Chinese government. Victor, essentially, when we asked him about Peng Shui, rolled out every line of propaganda that China has come up with on this case. Firstly, I mean, this idea from China that Peng Shui has all of a sudden just changed her mind and said it didn't happen. It's total nonsense. It's not like she just said there was an incident with Zhang Li and it was pretty vague. Her allegations are so detailed. They go over many years. They go over instances of humiliation, coercion, abuse. And so China's position that all of a sudden she just said, oh, it never happened. It's nonsense. Once you've read the Weibo statement from Peng Shui, there's no way that all of that was just made up. Victor and China's position is that she's retracted everything that she said. She's happy and life goes on. To an extent, life might go on. I suspect they've cut a deal with Peng Shui and said, if you never mention this in public again, if you never utter another word about what happened to you, you can live a happy life. You can live a normal life in Beijing and no one will cause you any trouble. If you rock the boat, though, then they'll be held to pay. And that, I think, is why she has been rolled out for a couple of statements that clearly, I mean, she looks like a hostage in some of those videos and and the interviews that she's done. The other thing Victor does is effectively try and defend the position of Zhang Gaoli, this Chinese leader. And the arguments he comes up with for this are farcical, bordering on insulting. He claims that Peng Shui won is over the age of 18, so eh, she can make her own decisions and she got into a consensual relationship with this man, so whatever happened, happened, and bad luck, that's on her. That's one of his arguments. Another one is that she's an athlete. She is obviously physically fit, so if he did try and force her into sex, she could defend herself. His other claim is that she's 175 centimetres tall, which is quite tall for a Chinese woman, And so as such, once again, she is too big for any man in China to overpower. Tom says the list of excuses that Victor Gao rolled out could be bordering on comical if they weren't so serious. 
that at the heart of what might sound ridiculous to us are serious allegations of a young woman who once told the world she was forced into sex with one of China's most powerful men, a political heavyweight in one of the most influential governments in the world. The story of Peng Shui may be unique in nature in terms of who is at the centre of the accusations and that they came from someone so well-known in China. But as Ya Chu Wang reminds us, Peng Shui is not an individual case. She represents women who want gender equality, want their injustice to be addressed. So it's a whole movement. And she's right. It is a whole movement. The next wave of feminism led by Chinese women who've had enough. The same movement we've seen in countries everywhere since 2017. The Me Too movement. Well, I just want to say Tarana Burke is amazing. She started the whole Me Too movement, as well as Melissa Milano, who's done incredible work bringing forward women's stories. And I'm just, I'm so in awe of the women who are coming forward. Whatever we wear, wherever we go, yes means yes and no means no. We're all human beings and everybody has a story. And now people are standing up and paying attention. So if we talk about the Me Too movement, it really, that was inspired by the USA. It's an anti-sexual harassment movement. That really uh, led to dozens of men being fired and public shamed for their uh, sexual misconduct. Then uh, that global Me Too movement created ripple effect in China. While it may have taken a year or so for the movement to build momentum in a country where freedom of speech is not only discouraged, but outlawed, By 2018, Me Too had found its place in China. Here's Dr. Pan Wang again. So in 2018, uh, January, there was a Chinese citizen named Luo Tianjian who published a 3,000-word post on Weibo revealing a secret that she had uh, kept to herself for 12 years. So she was sexually harassed by her PhD supervisor from uh, Beihang University in Beijing. So her post then received millions of views and was widely circulated through the Chinese media. And then as a result, the university professor was sacked by the university. And that started different waves of accusations. We started to see more Chinese women and men, of course, break their silence and share their own accounts of sexual harassment at workplace, on campus, etc. One voice in China may be easy to censor, but when the Me Too movement began to swell, it couldn't be stopped. Time was up on prominent CEOs, actors, talent managers and more. Powerful men were being called to account everywhere, even within mainland China. Most recently, we do hear familiar names uh, like the megastar Chris Wu and uh, news anchor. Tian Feng, and also China's uh, permanent TV host, Zhu Jun, etc. They were all involved in, in this accusation against the sexual harassment movement in China. So you can see this Me Too movement is a marker of China's fourth wave of women's movement. If we look at that more broadly, this you can see is really led by tech-savvy young feminist activists focusing on gender equality and combating uh, sexual harassment and misconduct. So this is a key feature. And uh, social media was used as a platform to spread out these uh, messages to ordinary women uh, who were not necessarily feminists, but also who were involved in this wave. This involved information sharing and voicing their anger about sexism on the internet or via different forms of social media. And this also, of course, is backlashed by the PRC government who doesn't really tolerate activism. Pan Wang says for women who speak out in China, it's not always as unsafe as we might want to believe. For the average person, making an accusation online at worst probably results in their post being removed or their account being deactivated. 
women can always voice their opinions wherever they are. It's just、uh, China that has strong censorship, and、uh, that mechanism is in place. If the government spots anything that is Sensitive, subversive, or mobilizing feminist movement, they will block and remove、uh, these accounts. So you can't say that they're not safe saying this. People do have a voice; they do have freedom of speech. But、uh, whenever that happens and deemed inappropriate by the government, that will be blocked and removed. Sure, you might not go to jail if you speak out or disappear like Peng Shui, but these women are still being silenced. The best they can hope for is that their social media posts spread far and fast enough before the censorship machine moves to remove all traces of their content. When people discuss it too much, the government came in and start to delete posts, censor, remove your accounts, stink, harass women's rights activists. You know, I always felt during the three or four years, like this movement died down because the government is here. Then later, another woman came. Forward and say something. Then everybody start discuss again. Then after a few months, I feel this is done. Then it just keeps going. So I would say, you know, the, the movement keeps surprising me. They just keeps going, which really says there's just genuine grassroots desire for gender equality in China. Women are very angry. You know, there's just this massive support for having those sexual assault. Harassment cases addressed society wide. So even with all this censorship and harassment and crackdowns, women just keep going. But it wasn't until Peng Shui's Weibo confession that the international community began to get a sense of how victim survivors in China are fighting back. Ya Chu again. I think you know she is part of this movement, and for the international community to. Pay attention to report on the case. You know we're talking in the podcast. I think that is you know contributing to her case to be remembered for the Chinese Me Too movement to be remembered for the women's rights movement in China to be、uh, remembered. You know we have the freedom to talk. People in China don't, so we should do our part. Across the globe and within organizations like the Women's Tennis Association, people are standing up for Peng Shui. And the women in China just like her, because as Yachu Wang describes, if we don't, who will? This kind of repression on people who has criticized the government is so well documented. So, given what happened before, we all know that she can't just freely say, you know, I want this to be investigated. It's also important, really, to strengthen women's legal awareness and the legal protection for them in the event of sexual harassment, for example, at workplace or at anywhere. And there is no anti-sexual harassment law implemented in China, and that is needed. And at the same time, running campaigns against sexual harassments and promoting women's rights and encouraging women to speak out. And, and also to minimize all forms of gender-based violence is important. Senior researcher at Human Rights Watch Yachi Wang thinks the global attention on this case has been instrumental in ensuring Peng Shui's safety. The international attention on her is definitely a good thing. Doing this job for these years, you know, for seeing people who have criticized the government then got disappeared into the black hole of the Chinese. Justice system, you know, some people eventually they were released, and then they escaped China. They would tell us stories saying, you know, the international attention on my case was always good. The officers who were in charge of my case knew there were people watching, so they were more careful in terms of how they were dealing with me. So I think the same thing applies to Peng Shui. So even you know we couldn't. See direct evidence to compare with. Had there not been attention, what what would happen to her? But given what happened to many other people before, I would say you know it's helpful. Peng Shui may be safe, and her story may have set about an irreversible chain of events that Beijing and those of us on the outside looking in cannot ignore. 
Because of Peng Shui, a whole new audience and generation have been exposed to the human rights abuses within China. Hopefully it means the spotlight won't stray too far so that the stories of other survivors and champions of China's Me Too movement can be heard everywhere. Even after their silent protests disappear from the online space. The disruption and progress Peng Shui's bravery endorsed aside, one question remains, and it's one that we can't really answer. Will Peng Shui ever be free? In my heart of hearts, I unfortunately, I just can't see a situation where China would ever let Peng Shui freely travel the world again. And if that's the case, then it's unlikely we're ever going to hear her speak without coercion and intimidation about what really happened with the Vice Premier of China. So it's a sad situation. You see these images of Peng Shui and you think that poor woman, that poor woman who as far as we know, has done absolutely nothing wrong, except one time she tried to tell the truth. Tennis fans won't see Peng Shui return to the court either. In that interview with Le Kip, she announced her retirement as she thanked fans from across the world for supporting her. I think Peng Shui certainly prefers a quiet life, given all these happened. I suppose she would like to just play sports. And there was no more acquisitions, no more politics, no more trouble. Whatever Peng Shui does next or wants from her life from here, however she chooses to speak against or placate the government of her home country, what we might not have realised is that there's more at stake for Peng Shui than just her own freedom. So many people have been imprisoned for criticizing the government. So many people have disappeared in some kind of, you know, house arrest. If that doesn't happen to you, you know, some human rights activists I talk to, they don't care about my own safety, my own life anymore because I just demand the freedom. But then they care about their families. I have wife, I have husband, I have children, I have parents. So in a lot of cases, the government will threat their loved ones. This is like the a very effective tactic you know you want your child to be fine you don't want your child to be followed to school every day you want child to be able to go to school you know you want your parents to live freely like you know i choose human rights i my parents didn't choose human rights my wife didn't choose human rights so the government in a way you know using that kind of tactic we would call you know, guilty by association to suppress what you can do. So it's never just about you. It means, you know, other people too. You know, we don't know what happened to Peng Shui's parents. It's not hard to imagine her parents are being talked to by the government. You just think of this poor woman who for the rest of her life has no freedom, has fear of what could happen to her if she says the wrong thing. And it's, it's really sad. Can I see her? Gaining freedom? Sadly, probably not. Free or not, one thing Peng Shui needn't fear is the security of her legacy. That the world will remember her and her courage to speak when she was expected to be silent. She's very brave. But I think interestingly, because in China, speaking against the government always incurs such high risks. So anybody who does that is very brave. It almost always done in because of you feel such a sense of injustice. It's like it has to be done rather than a calculated move. Because if you do any kind of rational calculation, the answer is never do it. So obviously she's very courageous. Thank you for listening to this episode of Extraordinary Stories. It was written by me, Emma Gillespie, and produced by myself with Callie Borg and Tia Usich. Audio production is by Madeline Joannou. That marks the end of the disappearance of Peng Shui Extraordinary Stories season. We'll see you very soon for another exciting, extraordinary story.